I got a sense this morning of the complexity of your situation here. It's also daunting to come as a South African because I've realized over the past 21 years, we've been a democracy for 21 years, people look to us for a solution. Um, and we're looking to you for a solution. So um, we're looking everywhere else. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's perfectly obvious what the answer to my question is, is that we're notionally a post-conflict society, but, you know, are you ever post anything is, is, is part of the question. In, um, I've said to Wasim, he must be very strict about time because, boy, I can talk. Um, so I like to look at myself. I love the sound of my own voice. But um, so please just stop me. And in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to give much uh, background um, about South Africa. I thought I'd focus more on what we try to do across different institutions uh, around race and change uh, in South Africa. So I work in Stellenbosch University, with, and that's a picture uh, on the left. It is historically the intellectual home of apartheid. So in my, in my university, the most successful psychologist in the history, I'm a psychologist, the most successful psychologist by far in the history of South Africa was somebody you might have heard of. His name was Eche Furvurt, who was prime minister of our country, and he was known as the architect of apartheid. So he was in my department. So um, I, I get very pleased when you say, have things changed? Well, the last three heads of departments in my department were me, a Jew, then a, a, a black Christian man, and, I, and the current head of the department is a Muslim. So I think Pavut must be turning in his grave a little bit. But we have a lot of... Sorry? Hey? <laughs> the next week, I'll talk about the gender issues in our department at, at another time. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a, a lot... A lot of things have changed, but a lot of things haven't. Four kilometers from my department, which is in this beautiful university, is a place called Kayamandi, which is the African township outside of uh, Stellenbosch. You can, you can walk there easily. I've walked to and from. We have very few students who come from Kayamandi to our university, which is a historically well-resourced university, um, partly because of the education system, partly because of discrimination on the basis of language. Um, in our province, we have three official languages, English, Afrikaans, which is the dominant language and the, used to be the dominant language of our university. It isn't anymore. And Kosa, which although is an official language, it's very difficult to get access anywhere, for example, to healthcare and so on, if you are Kosa speaking. So it's quite common. A lot of the work that I do is on, on language and access to healthcare. And still today, a person who was born and bred in Cape Town can go to a hospital and find nobody who can speak their language. So this is 21 years into democracy. Quite close by to us is another university, which is on the left at the bottom there, called the University of the Western Cape. Under apartheid, um, universities were designated by race. And so there were a number of white universities, and then separate universities were created for separate racial ethnic groups. And the Uni University of the Western Cape was or originally created for what we call in South Africa the colored community, which is people who have a range of mixed origins, um, and it already oh, yeah, I have hardly started. And, <laughs> and uh, it was created um, largely as a colored institution. It's now um, a very a mixed institution, as is ours, but it's a, um, this, the students at UWC tend to be generically not white, black, colored, and poor. Our students tend to be are much more mixed, but much more well off. Um, and I'm going to talk about a project across the two universities that, uh, that uh, we engaged with. So this project is called the Community Self and Identity Project. There is a book that we've written on it, which is available for free download. So I'll, if people want to, be, to read our book, um, I can give you the, the website. And we worked with a group of students, um, some from my department at Stellenbosch and some at the University of the Western Cape, using a variety of techniques to engage with, with issues of citizenship, um, and really educating social workers, occupational therapists, and psychology students for working with diversity and confronting their own diversity. Um, we used a combination of face-to-face -face, uh, methods and a lot of online engagement and using of multiple methods. So uh, we used uh, there's a, a mixed ability dance group um, who, who we've used. There here is a, um, a, a famous South African artist, a colored artist, known as Bernie Searle, who came to talk about her work. She talks a lot about race, 
skin cooking. She's covered herself there with um, uh, spices and identity. And there's been a parallel process in the training of uh, facilitators. And here I'd like to thank particularly the late, late Ahmad Hijazi from Neve Shalom and Ariella, who's here, who have helped us as facilitators think about our own positioning um, in relation to the work that we do. Apartheid is, was, apart from being about race, apartheid was about space. And Cape Town remains one of the most spatially divided cities in the world. So one of the things that I just want to show you is how we got students from a very different uh, linguistic communities with different skills in English, which is the common language, to work together. Part of what we got them to do was to draw maps of their own communities. And I'm going to show you um, just a couple of examples of this. So this is, uh, this is a, a colored student, a student of mixed origin, drawing a picture of an urban uh, environment in which she lives with, with the range of difficulties that, that uh, they have. Um, much more tentative drawing, and we've had these drawings analyzed, is an African student from rural areas um, uh, could tend to, 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 in fact, draw in a much less confident way than, than more, more privileged students um, showing their environment. And then this is a, an Afrikaans-speaking white student from a very wealthy environment um, drawing her um, in, uh, where she comes from. But what, what we used these maps to do was to facilitate discussion among students who'd often been studying together for, for many, many years but had never discussed where they came from because they're in the so-called neutral space of the university. And I want to just give you some examples of the sorts of things that come up. Um, so g g g the one said, uh, from, from a position of a, a poor community, lack of resources and lack of development was common in most of the communities. But I felt so small because I was the only person talking about the rural area, which was, which was no one else brought up. It's not an English-speaking student. And this made me feel that my group members might be shocked about how bad rural areas are. And then a privileged white student saying, Generally, that one does not know that, that not all communities have available um, running water. Group discussion made me aware that people in my group don't even have running water at home. Um, I was once, I made me aware of the fact that I was once again taking privileges for granted. Something that happens in the so-called post-conflict is political issues of resources become personal. And, and there's a lot of shame on all sides. So I'm ashamed that I'm poor, but I'm also ashamed at my privilege. So it all becomes, and becomes very difficult to engage with um, personally. Um, similarly, the information that we were confronted with was, was eye-opening, reflecting suffering and human resilience. The black ladies in our group shared moments of true hardships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this is a student who was really reflecting about even learning from our white group members, this is a colored student speaking, what it's like to have never experience want was interesting. Even the moments of defense and making its excuses were informative. So if you give a safe space, students are able to, to work in spheres of discomfort. Being bundled into a group with strangers from diverse cultures, um, disciplines, races, ethnicity, and socioeconomic backgrounds was anxiety-provoking and quite invasive, considering that we were expected to share quite personal experience with these strangers. Yes, this encounter gave me a meaningful glim glimpse into how our clients must feel. Um, uh, so we made a lot of progress, I think, with our students in this project, but there was a lot of discussion amongst the students saying this is basically the problem of the educators. We're all old left-wing people who are part of the struggle. We remember apartheid. And they, they, would, they would say things to one another. These are quotes from him. It's your, your mind is the battlefield. Apartheid was your past, not mine. Um, and the question that we have to raise for ourselves is, are we imposing our own issues on students? Or are we generally past, and they're generally past, is it, or are we actually dealing with denial? And I love Armstrong, who's a He's an ancient historian, but with a psychoanalytic bent. Talks about, he says, the past will not play dead for us. There's no over over there. And some recent, very recent contemporary events in South Africa have made it in, in, they're, they're difficult, but they've made it much easier to talk about these issues. 21 years after democracy at the University of Cape Town, which is the premier, I used to be there, premier institution um, on the African continent, there was a statue of Cecil John Rhodes, you can see up at the back there, who was the arch-colonialist and imperialist, but who gave a lot of land to the nation. The University of Cape Town is built on land that he was given. And a group of black students last month made a campaign called the Rhodes Must Fall campaign, which 
is quite similar to some of the, the Black Lives Matter and I Can't Breathe campaigns in, in, in the United States. And the Statue of Rhodes was removed two weeks ago. So it's taken 21 years to remove the Statue of Rhodes. Now, obviously, it's a, it's a symbolic thing, um, but it, it shows, I think, that something is happening around actually being able to think about race 21 years after uh, democracy, despite the fact that the revolution in South Africa is, as Adam Habib, who's the vice chancellor of Wits University, says our revolution has been suspended for a range of, of reasons. The other thing which I'm very embarrassed to talk about is the enormous rise in waves and waves of, of xenophobia within South Africa. Without other African countries, South Africa would not have had the transition that we had because they, well, our fighters were all in, you know, many of them were in neighboring countries. There's just been a, a, a large, um, lot of xenophobic violence, including killings. And King Goodwill Zuelatini, who's a traditional Zulu monarch, um, set off the latest wave by saying, we're requesting those who come from outside to please go back to their country. And really what he's, what's happening around xenophobia is the reality is that although we have many rich black people in South Africa, the gap between rich and poor has, has increased and foreigners are competing for very scarce resources with people who are, relatively speaking, worse off than they were before the transition. This is my final slide. We, um, we um, uh, are no longer running this course. We've been training uh, university educators, um, and that's been quite a mixed thing, but it's been, it's been quite useful. What's absolutely striking for me as an educator in a privileged university is the blindness of power. My students don't want to hear about, my largely white students even, and privileged black students don't want to hear about, about um, the, the past, but I think that we have to take responsibility and, and pleasure in our, in our privilege. There's a recent paper by um, Brendan Barnes on what he calls the psychologization of class and development, that we're very good in South Africa now of talking about change. We have a tr had a truth and reconciliation. We talk in very emotional terms. And I think that's extremely important. I'm a psychologist, but without material change, the emotional can actually paper over the cracks of, of the material. Ashil Mbembe, who's a Cameroonian, I don't know how many of you know his famous book on the post colony. He, he's in Johannesburg. Um, he's just written and just given a remarkable speech on post colonialism and xenophobia in South Africa, which is on YouTube, which I just want to recommend to you. But, um, we like to think in South Africa that we're in some post a historical period. And I think that events of the past, in fact, two weeks, uh, have, have shown us that, uh, that history is not over. And if there's, if people say, what is your message? And my message is, is, you know, don't, don't, memory is complex and contested, as you said before, but please don't, don't allow things to, to, don't allow yourselves to forget. A, a friend of mine writing about the transition in South Africa, about the notion of freedom, has written a very important article, I think, called Free to Shop. So people are now free to, many, some people are free to buy more things. You want a different kind of change in your country, and I hope you get it. Thank you. Today I'm going to share with you a little bit my work in uh, the last more than a decade already uh, in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans. Um, and I want to sort of open the question, what can we as Israelis and Palestinians learn from uh, Kosovars and uh, Serbs and Albanians? Uh, and in the broader sense from this post-conflict, which I can also end the question mark as, as on yours. Uh, I guess one of the differences is that the post-conflict moment is a little bit more recent, in, especially when we're talking to Kosovo. So I'm gonna, uh, I am going to give a little bit of background just because I assume that as when I speak in the Western Balkans to people about uh, our conflict here, I, I try to give kind of uh, some images and some uh, entry points to know our way around, and that's what I'm going to try and do uh, in relation to Kosovo and Serbia relations. And then I'm going to, as much as time will allow me, and uh, maybe I'll still few minutes, talk about uh, sort of processes of recognitions with a lot of question mark there that are happening as we speak now in the negotiations between political elites. But then, if time allows me, I'll talk a bit more about my own research, which looks, which looks at processes as such in civil society among the people-to-people -people, uh, projects, if you want to think about it that way. 
My other work in recent years talks about, uh, it looks at memory, collecting memory, and what we as scholars in peace and conflict studies, how can memory studies help us in our analyses of conflict and post-conflict uh, societies and intergroup relations, as well as internal processes within. So I look in my work more at processes within Serbia as it has to do with memory and memory activism, and then I connect it also to serb albanian relationship, which I'll talk about uh, more today. And I realize with this uh, question of recognition that we also can, maybe hakara is one word in Hebrew, but possibly I'll touch, I'll, I can contribute to some questions about also processes of acknowledgement through a, a process of the construction of, a, of, a, of collective memories, which is very much on the table in this space, which I'm going to take you uh, through. So uh, not to do a history lesson and not to do a sort of a crash course to the Western Balkans or the successor states of the former Yugoslavia as we talk about them, but uh, basically uh, what I'm going to talk today will focus much more on relations between Serbs from Serbia and uh, Albanians from Kosovo, or as they call it, Kosovo, uh, as well as relations between Belgrade and Pristina, and internal relations within Kosovo are also another dimension that I'll touch upon. I'm not going to talk about Bosnia, and for me, it's very interesting that usually in comparative work that I hear here, there's much more kind of throwing in the Bosnia case study, though I see the Kosovo case study as much more uh, relevant if we want to think comparatively, and this is what I'm uh, trying to do in my work. Also, I think, um, and this is my hat, as, as uh, coming from here and also working in many years and becoming aware here of the power relations. In our conflict, one of the initial things that I was very interested in was the shift in power relations that happened already in the case of Kosovo, which I think Again, we have to the moment after, the possible moment, it's a very, on one hand, possibly scary. On the other hand, the process that I think we can learn a lot from here um, to, to our inquiries. Uh, altogether, in, in this space, which again, we call the post-Yugoslav uh, space, we talk, I, I like also to throw in the three posts that I'm talking about. Not just talking about post war in my work, I also need to bring in the post Yugoslav moment and the post socialist moment, which definitely defines today the relations between the groups, the identities of the people. Many people, for example, still consider themselves Yugoslavs. They reject the current structures that were created in the aftermath of the breakup of their country. And especially in Kosovo, in Serbia, in the intergroup relations, the post Yugoslav moment is very important in terms of the language. The older generation of Albanians in Kosovo still speak Serbian. They had to study it in socialist Yugoslavia. Young people who were born in the 90s and on, they don't speak Serbian anymore. So there's no more common language for people to talk to each other. They may need to opt for English, even in some cases, as I saw in encounters of civil society organizations. And so this is kind of something to throw into our discussion, as well as um, uh, just another point that in, when I started my work on intergroup relations and the relations between Serbs and Albanians, actually I found out that in the existing research, there's very little research done about these topics, especially from the angle of the interdisciplinary work that we are all talking about today. There is much more work in defined by IR scholarship, international relations, the political scientists who don't want to uh, do interdisciplinary work, which from my end sort of uh, created a big challenge. For example, I was lacking work which is based on empirical work, ethnographic work, uh, which looks sort of inside into the processes of the post-war moment. Uh, and this is a little bit what I'm trying to sort of fill in this gap in, in, my own, uh, in my own work. So a few words to touch upon what is now already history. But as uh, if, we, if we just talk about the war, so there, are, there were a sequence of wars in the breakup of Yugoslavia, first in Croatia, then in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and only 
in the late 90s is the war in Kosovo. And Serbia, where I am based, and the language that I studied for my work is Serbian, I don't speak Albanian, was actually in, involved in all the wars, in all the three wars, which creates a huge burden, of course, if we are interested today in issues of memory and uh, conflict transformation. So a few words just to give you the context. Uh, late 80s, when the Yugoslavia still exists with its Sixth Republic, but Milosevic comes to power, and one of the first things he will do, he will abolish the autonomous status that Kosovo had within Yugoslavia. So Kosovo Albanians had their golden years, let's say, from the constitution of 74 until 89, uh, when Milosevic's uh, regime sort of dismantles the autonomous region. And actually, from an Albanian point of view, we're entering a decade of what they would very openly talk about as apartheid-like regime. The, 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 uh, the province is fully controlled by uh, the Serbs, the Serbian uh, police rather than the, the military is in full control. We see the appearance of checkpoints of people being thrown out of their job places and eventually what will culminate to ethnic cleansing process. Um, in, in that process, the Albanians are creating parallel structures and a shadow government. And their main agenda, main agenda, politically speaking, until around 96, is peaceful resistance. And that would be, and, and only in 96, 97, the Kosovo Liberation Army, the KLA, will appear as an actor in the conflict, and the conflict will escalate to full-fledged war in 98, 99. And very interesting, and, and I'm skipping it very quickly, but what's very important for what comes after is the way the war ended. And the war, unlike the war in Bosnia, when everyone came as the biggest loser, there were no winners. Here there is a very clear winner and loser. So the Albanians, um, after the war, are actually entering a, a very rapid process of a state building. And there is a complete shift in power relations within a Kosovo itself. So the Albanians are, after being ethnically cleansed and actually uh, expelled from their houses, uh, they are returning to, um, to Kosovo. And the Serbs, with, of course, after the way the war ended with the entrance of the NATO forces, the international interventions, the Serb police will withdraw physically from the space and with them the Serbian population. And I have five minutes, so I have no idea. I'm going to get to what, to what I need. But the point I want to make here is a complete shift of power relations, which completely also uh, reorganizes, I would say, relations between Serbs who become now minority uh, within their own uh, place and the country which they have no reference to and they cannot identify with. One more point, it can come up maybe in the discussion, that Pristina, the capital city of Kosovo, used to be a mixed city. Serbs were living in some certain neighborhoods, Albanians in the outskirts. Today, you can count with two hands, possibly, the number of Serbs who still live in Pristina. About 60, 70 thousands of Serbs no longer live in Pristina. They live actually in the outskirts or in Serbia proper. And of course, in the north, which is the red part of northern Kosovo, which has geographical continuation with Serbia proper. A few words about the aftermath of the war. In Serbia proper, the international intervention, the NATO intervention is uh, mostly seen, uh, the three months of intervention mostly is today narrated in narr narratives of victimization. The whole world was against us. We are actually the victims. There's no reference to what was done in Kosovo during the bombing, the war crimes, the, a, any question of a, responsibility to the crimes, the ethnic cleansing. It's all about, and it was just now the 16th anniversary of the NATO bombing, not even any reference to Serb-Albanian relations or to actual the people who live in Kosovo itself. And on the other hand, the Albanian narrative actually takes this event from 1999 as a moment of liberation. This is just an image of the NATO forces entering Kosovo 
and the kids and, and the population comes back with them and throws flowers on them, which will actually allow eventually Kosovo to declare unilaterally independence in 2008 and two main, two main narratives to come up to emerge as the main narratives today among Albanians in Kosovo. One is a narrative of liberation and of course with that there is the complete defeat of the Serbs and the other is the narrative of sacrifice and in that sense the narrative of the KLA soldiers sort of took over uh, overnight the peaceful resistance was so this is an internal process within Albanians. The peaceful mo resistance movement was completely uh, uh, moved aside. And today, everything in, in Kosovo is about the KLA, the armed resistance, Ucheka, or Adam Yashari, who is one of the, uh, the main sort of, one of the fighters of KLA who actually sacrificed himself and his uh, members of family uh, sort of, and to date, it's, it's framed a sacrifice to the, state and to the state building of the new uh, Kosovo. So I have two minutes. I can highlight maybe a few things. One is the post-conflict uh, as uh, defined by the EU today. So there's still very massive international intervention in this process. We can ask whether it's good for, from the point of view of uh, ordinary people. Uh, the, the recent most, uh, and it's, it's framed as normalization, which for me, remembering the language of uh, normalization of the 90s, Tadbialalakat, and all these discussions, very, very interesting uh, in the context of today's Kosovo. But I can highlight here the, what, what the, EU, the EU saw as a healing process that um, by pushing the two sides to sign an agreement in Brussels in March, uh, in April, sorry, 2013, there's a whole literature about the processes of Europeanization, and one can ask, is our processes of uh, negotiations today or recognition between Serbs and Albanians have everything, anything to do with change of positions of people or with getting closer in terms of processes of say, peace building and reconciliation, or it's all up to outside pressure uh, before the region will be uh, joining the EU or probably in the next uh, enlargement process, who knows when, in the, last, in the coming uh, decades. So I'll skip my scenarios, but what I wanted to show you is that in reality, uh, the reality shows anything in the relations between the groups but normalization. Just two examples, if anyone uh, follows international football, the recent game in Belgrade, when a drone with the greater Albanian flag flies into the in the city center of Belgrade and the 24 hours after the, the, the city is on a, a whole a mess. And uh, an attempt of the foreign minister of, uh, of uh, Kosovo who meets regularly the foreign minister of uh, Serbia uh, in Brussels to come visit in Belgrade. And actually Belgrade blocks this process and say, if you're gonna come, we're going to arrest you because you were one of the leaders of KLA and there's actually, uh, you were, he was trialed in, 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 in absence in, in Belgrade uh, during the war in 98, 99. So I'll end just with uh, my final slide, which actually shows a little bit more about the research that I did, uh, the people to people relations, as, as Nava told me when I spoke in Neve Shalom, Wacht al Salam on Friday, she said, what good can you bring us from the Balkans? So, uh, which, and it's too depressing, she said. And actually, a lot of the work that is being done, uh, and there is work being done uh, on the civil society, on the level of people to people. And uh, if you just see the structured encounter, I won't have time to talk about the unstructured one. But I looked at one program, one sort of program that brings students from universities in Serbia to visit. Uh, Kosovo and the other way around and I joined them on the bus rides and on their visits and, and did some in-depth interviews with them. A uh, very interesting process of what I would say then not only the need of recognition but also working around questions of acknowledgement but I'll end with the but because um, the, the practices of civil society in the Western Balkans were again defined by international intervention. And the internationals who came to the Western Balkans in the aftermath of the war 
brought the language, the technicalities, the money, and the thinking of transitional justice processes, and not of processes of peace building or conflict transformation, what created on the ground some hybridities, I think, that uh, raise interesting questions if we are asking uh, what about recognition, acknowledgement, and reconciliation? I want to talk about a hollowed out peace. Um, and uh, this thing's working by itself. Um, if you can um, see the Einstein quote, uh, I want to say, that can't solve problems with the same thinking we used to create them. And insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get a different result. Um, I have been uh, obviously on the insanity trail for some time uh, because we've been we we started off with assumptions in Northern Ireland about how we could do things with the fractured community. Northern Ireland, in context terms, uh, uh, we we were in a very asymmetrical setting up of the state. The state formed in twenty two after a, a a war of independence following the first world war. Um, Northern Ireland came into existence with a two-thirds third majority of Unionist stroke Protestant uh, stroke British um, uh, people having the majority. And clearly they viewed the minority one-third of the Catholic nationalist uh, people behind that, uh, left behind in the, in the state as a problem, as a threat. And so the state set about negating that threat uh, as best it could. And that was through fairly heavy forms of discrimination. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, that led to was peace process was a was a civil rights movement, as you probably all know, and that led into uh, eventually violence because the, the majority group reacted, and there was an action reaction situation, um, which led eventually 40, 30, 40 years on into a peace process. Uh, the place. Still doing it, but anyway, I'll go back. Um, the um, the Karamila community for which I, I work was founded in '65, and uh, so it predates the main uh, civil rights movement, and that's of interest because it, it wasn't it, it it responded to the conflict as opposed to was a response to the conflict, and we started off with understanding that there was a deeply fractured nature of the state and the people in the state. Uh, as I, as a gr Catholic growing up um, in the community, uh, could go to school, be raised in a family, go to school. You'll recognize some of this. Uh, go to um, uh, university, uh, uh, work even, and hardly ever knowingly meet somebody from the other community because we were set up in a, in a variety of ways. Um, uh, that fracturing. Uh, was something we tried to build across, and the community's been doing that for some time. So what I want to do now is this issue of context matters. Uh, we, um, we really do now need, we're at a stage where we're trying to figure out where we are and where we need to go. We are in what I would call a barely tolerated coexistence. So we have, we've got rid of the major aspects of the violence but we have not sorted out the, the, the issues between us. And we are um, trying to figure that out as we go. Um, when we look at this slide here, um, the Orange Church of God, you'll see uh, uh, who is the shark in the middle of all this? Is it the church? Or is it the surfers, skateboarders, musicians, the vegetarians, the occupiers? Perspective matters. Whose side is God on? It seems that hell is going to be very busy in the next little while. Um, uncertainty is where we, as peace builders, we need to work with. Too often we're asked to write grants which provide uh, issues of certainty. That we say we're going to work with X number of people and we're going to do Y number of things and achieve these results. It's rubbish. It's nonsense. And we all know that, I suspect. Um, I'll tell you a quick joke about uncertainty. Um, as was in with this translate, but uh, this is there's a man at the at the reception point of an asylum, and um, he he picks the phone rings and he picks it up, and the voice says, "Could you tell me is room three four five empty?" He says, "Well, hold on a minute," and he goes and checks and comes back to the, f the 
phone and said, yeah, three, four, five is empty. He said, could you just go and double check that for me? So he goes off and checks it, comes back. He says, yeah, it is definitely empty. That's great. It means I've escaped. Uh, so what we need to do is learn to escape, uh, escape the issues of certainty. And the, the problem for the guy now outside of the, the asylum is how do you live outside of the place you know? That's the big challenge. And that's where the uncertainty is. It's not the, it's not the past, which we can then give narratives of certainty about, but it is the, it is the, the question of the future. Um, very quickly on this, if, you, uh, if I stretched a piece of elastic out and this was going towards the space that we want to go to, all the kinetic energy, all the energy stored in that elastic when I let it go wants to spring back. That's the trap of history. Martin Luther King did not say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. That, and he stretches back from the vision. So we need to create a vision of new, of new narratives. Um, this Kinefin system that I'm going to run through very quickly is uh, um, a system that we're beginning to adapt and adjust on. It basically says that we work within a, a number of different systems and structures. Simple systems where cause and effect are very close. Okay, and sometimes in our work, cause and effect are very close. If I'm running a respite program for people who are, have been directly uh, hit, uh, hit by the troubles, then I can provide support, care, and look after them, and that's fine. But it doesn't change the major back response. I just want to kind of say that at the bottom, a bottom of this. And we can create best practice around this, but it is about sensing, categorizing, and responding. So we need to see what are we trying to do, what's our sense of what we need to do, categorize it, and then respond. The next system is about being complicated. Compl complicated systems, like at 747, has a lot of cause and effect, but it's not clear where the cause and effect is. And therefore, we need to sense, analyze, and respond when we're dealing with complicated systems. Um, and we need to, um, we need to uh, work on good practice rather than best practice. And that's, that's, a, that's the story we will come back to and without some questions. However, the major part of this story I bring to you today is we find ourselves working more often in systems of complexity, which where cause and effect are, not, are separated. Uh, you can't always determine uh, what, what cause and what effect is going to happen. And you can't rerun it in backwards terms. Com complicated systems you can deconstruct and reconstruct. Um, those of you who have raised children will know that you can't deconstruct them. You can make it, you know, you got to some point you realize, oh, that wasn't great. Um, uh, can, I, can I reverse engineer them? Uh, no, you can't. You're going to have to work on it. So complexity is emergent. That's the key point about this. Uh, and we need to become much more experimenters. We need to be see ourselves not providing linear step-by-step -step answers, uh, even though too often the funders ask us to do that. We need to move beyond that. Chaotic systems are, as what you speak, where there is no, it's random. Uh, and violence is often very chaotic. And what you need to do when you're working in a chaos system, as you will know very well, is to provide some st anchoring points, some stabilizing points. Um, the last position, as you will see, is what's called disordered, which is the space that I suppose we are mostly in, um, uh, in that we don't know which of these systems that we're in. Which system are we in? And the state of disorder is not knowing, and that's what we need to, to figure out. So you can then see how this works together. In the center of spaces, they're always interacting, and we need to work through this. Decadent centenaries history, as you've been working through today, plays a uh, different, uh, still plays strongly in Northern Ireland. Unionist perspective, Republican perspective, both claiming God, both claiming uh, a, de a, you know, a decade of memory of centenaries, but no certainties. Perspective is always very different. More for you is less for me. How many of us want an NGOs and we're grant writing and we're trying to work off so we win the grants? Okay, uh, 
this is a model, but the, the, the main story of this model, uh, we don't have time to go through it, is the fact that it's the underpinning part of the iceberg, which is, which is not always visible to you, which is the thing that, that's where the narrative sits. And the narrative is looking to find a way out. And if we don't do that, um, and we can talk about, I actually have a thing called the Balkan effect in the middle of that, which I'll talk about later if you want. <laughs> um, can everybody see the, uh, the white triangle? Yeah? Can we see the right triangle? It doesn't exist. Your brain is inventing it. There are no lines here, white and white. Okay, so we need to we need to challenge perspectives. We need to get through this. Perhaps that's what what the media does for us. The hollowed out pieces. Here's a tunnel. On one side of the community still lies the nationalist community. On the other side of this tunnel lies the Protestant community. Uh, zero sum game. We run div division across all these elements. Still, there is no agreed. And the zero sum I mean is I win, you lose, add them together, zero. You win, I lose, add together, zero. We need to come out of that that cycle. The scapegoat system. We have to fracture the scapegoat system, where it's the quickest way to create internal solidarity is to find an external enemy. And we, and we still do that. And that's what's happening right now at this moment in time in Northern Ireland as we head to the election in, in November. Um, so what I want to say is, in fact, the, in the hollowed out piece, it is the edges is where all the certainties are. We have to create a center ground, which is more the place of uncertainty. We need a radical center to form, which is about that civic space, about the people standing up and claiming forward a vision that they want to do work with. It's tough out there. Multiple competing identities, hardened boundaries, narratives. Funding tracks crisis or self-interesting, including us in the peace industry. We build identity ghettos, but remember Einstein, doing it all over again, just creates it. Um, what we are talking about more uh, inside that hollowed out space is the qu deep question, how do we live and learn well together? And each one of those words is critical. It's about living, it's about learning, it's about being well. I'm gonna share this poem with you. It is both a dignity and a difficulty to live between these names, perceiving politics in the syntax of the state. At the end of the day, the reality is whether we change or whether we stay the same. These questions will remain. Who are we to be with one another? And how are we to be with one another? And what to do with all those memories of all those funerals? What about those present what about past, the past that was blasted far from the future? I wake, you wake, she wakes, he wakes, they wake. We wake and they take this troubled beauty forward. Thank you very much. On this paper, I would like to problematize the language choice that we make uh, to ourselves. This is part of a larger project. I'm writing a book on actually the status of Arabic among Arabs, how they view themselves uh, in different Arab countries. So my book is going to cover uh, a lot of countries such as Oman, Qatar, Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine and Israel, which I have visited all of these countries recently. Uh, in this uh, short time, I will just, uh, I'm going to look at Sasson Somech and Sayyid Kashur's writing through the lens of their personal biographies, their background and the symmetrical communal relations of each uh, and their respective language ability. In other words, the language choice. The language choices of these authors help us understand not only their backgrounds and biographies in terms of their socio logical uh, origins and the local asymmetrical relationship between Israelis and Arabs, but also global linguistic homogenization as well. Um, Sasson Somech, uh, I guess many people here know who he is. Uh, so I'll say it quickly. Iraqi uh, a Jew who came to Israel in the 1950s, studied at Tel Aviv in, uh, at Oxford University, and now Professor Emeritus in Tel Aviv. 
um, he went to Oxford to study Arabic and uh, his native language, and he studied with uh, uh, Mahmoud al-Badawi, uh, thus joining a cadre of influential scholars of Arabic trained by al-Badawi. Al-Badawi is Egyptian, but he was teaching in uh, Oxford. Uh, what distinguishes Sassan Somech is that uh, he's not an Orientalist like the rest of the students of Badawi, but rather an Iraqi Jew uh, studying with him. Sassan Somech himself problematizes his relationship to Badawi while at Oxford. He says it positively. He says, we didn't have any problem in spite of our identities, but in fact, the denial, the denialism tells us a lot about how... Uh, um, problematic became uh, Sasson Somech's Arab identity after he came to the state of Israel. Uh, Somech also writes in his, uh, he wrote two uh, biographies in Hebrew, autobiographies, about his name. The, his name is Hebrew, but it's an Arab uh, Hebrew name. And he said that, uh, you know, he didn't change it. He didn't want to change it like many other people arriving in Israel. And while his name is already Hebrew, it carries the reverberation of Hebrew in an Arab context and indicates his Arab uh, or origins. Um, so he didn't care about choosing an ethnically uh, less marked name. Um, he's the last of a generation of Iraqi Jews to actually know uh, Arabic uh, natively. We have the example of Yehuda Shinhar, who's a generation later, had to learn Arabic at an adult age. He made it out of a conscious choice and he told me last summer that his mother always complains that his uh, Arabic sounds too Palestinian for her. She's Iraqi. So I met uh, uh, Somech in Ramat Aviv uh, at the campus of Tel Aviv University last summer. And he spoke uh, with me about his uh, in Iraqi Arabic all the time, the entire meeting. And his topics varied from reminiscences of his life in Baghdad is, uh, uh, the following up with the literature scene in the Arab world, his friendship with Naguib Mahfouz in Egypt, his mentors in Baghdad. The, uh, his teachers in Baghdad were actually Shiite and communists. Uh, Hassan Sharara is one of them. And so there are, some of them are even Lebanese who went to and taught in Baghdad while he was there. Uh, one of the ironies which did not escape me while I was sitting with him uh, at, on campus in Tel Aviv is uh, that um, uh, Somech's physical world revolved for decades around northern Tel Aviv, a site of a ruined Arab village, Sheikh Mu'nis, with its abandoned mosque, pointing at uh, not too far of a time when the place used to speak Arabic, just like Sasson Somech. I want to compare him to Sayyid Kashur, and in fact, uh, Sayyid Kashur is the one who drew that comparison because he wrote a few years ago a short story in Haaretz, which I translated to Arabic, uh, on uh, being mistaken by identity at a conference in England, uh, they thought he was an Iraqi Jew, and he went along with that. Uh, <laughs> we all know about uh, that Sayyid Kashur was born in Tira in the 1980s, where her for his formative years, his father consciously sent him to uh, a Jewish school in Jerusalem, where uh, Hebrew became uh, the language of his choice. In his sitcom, he mentioned that 80% of the uh, language used in the sitcom uh, is Arabic, in spite of that it's, uh, it's uh, prime time Israeli television, and he thinks this is a victory uh, of it, but his sitcom is very unpopular among Israeli Arabs. It's more, it's a certain stratum of Israeli society that likes this sitcom. Uh, I invited Kashua to Michigan State University in fall 2014, and uh, he gave a talk in Arabic, and he gave another talk in English. He said it's the first time that he speaks in Arabic to an audience at the university uh, setting. Um, uh, he mentioned during both talks that in his village did not have a single library as he was growing and that his father emphasized the importance of reading but never provided his children with books other than one book of Lenin which deterred the young man from reading because of the severe faced picture of Lenin on the cover. <laughs> Kashua mentioned that his father was a member of the Communist Party in those days. Needless to say, it was this party that nurtured democratic values among uh, nationalists along with the nationalistic aspirations of the Israeli Arabs. Uh, Kashua's first encounter with the library and books was in his Jewish school, and he wrote world literature through Hebrew and not through Arabic. When asked at the Arabic talk whether he re reads any Arabic uh, literature, he said he read Najib Mahfouz through Hebrew, 
that he tried to read Al Mutanabi, uh, you know, the Arab poet from the Middle Ages, and he couldn't, uh, you know, take him. Uh, he abandoned that. He spoke to the students in a very rich Palestinian Arabic, very beautiful. I mean, he's a writer, he's a, that's his craft. But uh, uh, he commented that, uh, yes, it was the first time that he spoke Arabic. But one of the audience members said, you have such beautiful Arabic, why don't you write in it? And his answer was that uh, he already made the language shift. It was very painful. He was in secondary school when he made that. He, don't want, he doesn't want to go through this process again. But also there is a marketability issue for him is who's going to read his books. Arabs in Arab uh, countries will not read somebody coming from Israel. And that's the same for uh, Somech and others too. And in Israel, um, you know, so there isn't a market for him. He compared himself to Ala Ihlahil, his friend, who just wrote a wonderful novel about the history of Acre in, in, during the Napoleonic campaign. And he couldn't publish it. He couldn't find the publisher. So he published it himself. And uh, Hlehel put on his uh, mother's, uh, on his website that you could get the book from his mother's house. Um, <laughs> but so, uh, Israeli public is not interested in Arabic literature. And that's a fact. And, uh, and that reminds me of Ela Shohat, one of her recent books, uh, I think of last year. She makes reference to a larger Middle Eastern phenomenon. She observes that Middle East societies get to know each other through the medium of translating into English. And this is an indication to her as to how Eurocentric the Middle East is. Namely, that Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and I add Hebrew, she doesn't mention Hebrew, get to know each other through the medium of English and rarely through translating from one of these languages to another directly. In other words, post-colonial societies in their hierarchization of languages have not fully broken the mold of colonialism. Um, both uh, Kashua and uh, Somich use Hebrew as their language of writing, in spite of the fact that both of them are native speakers of Arabic. Um, uh, in fact, through his protagonist, Kashua is even concerned about his accent, and he tries to perfect uh, an Ashkenazi Hebrew accent. Um, I'm trying to be fast because, yes. Um, the formative years, in, in, con in contrast between uh, Kashua and Somech, the formative years of uh, Somech in Baghdad, where uh, uh, Baghdad was an affluent and confident city of the 1930s and 40s, a Baghdad which also imposed itself on the scene of the Arab intellectual Nahda, which was taking place at the time of his youth. He wrote in Arabic then and met some of the most important poets of Arabic literature at that time, such as the Jawahiri and the Sayyab, and uh, was taught by some of the most famous intellectuals in the Arab world. Um, both memoirs, what I, what I find interesting is the memoirs, the, most, the closest to himself, he wrote in Hebrew, uh, Somech, and um, Kashua has no intention, and I talked to him, of writing in Arabic any time. Uh, both of their books are translated into English, but not Arabic, except an attempt uh, at translating Kashua in Lebanon, and Kashua hated the translation. He thinks he couldn't recognize himself and his writing in the uh, Arabic translation. Um, Somech can be considered a rarity in his zeal to translate from Arabic to Hebrew. He does, and he did translate some of Mahmoud Darwish. And in fact, one of the things he told me, which I find ironic, is in addition to him being a member of both the Hebrew Academy and the Arabic Academy in Israel, he also uh, used to edit Mahmoud Darwish's poetry before Mahmoud uh, Darwish left the country. He would send him his poems to edit them uh, and correct their Arabic. Uh, so the Palestinian national poet was corrected by a Jewish Iraqi here in Israel. Um, Somech uh, concludes how Hebrew started to invade more and more the domains of his life. Somech says, uh, little by little, language melted into language, landscape into landscape, and culture into culture. Uh, in conclusion, what I'm trying to show in this paper is very little, really is that Somech and Kashua are demonstrating asymmetries that exist in their language choices. One asymmetry that is clearly apparent is that between Hebrew and Arabic inside Israel, 
this reflects the broader political relationship between Arabs and Jews, and that I am confirming literature also. There is literature on this. But also, both Arabic and Hebrew, uh, in the case of these two authors, encounter each other often through the global hegemony of English. This has parallels throughout the Middle East and its languages, if not a reflection of the global dynamics. Lastly, language choice remains a choice of the author in the end. Somich and Kashua's language choices are not solely determined by global forces, or even the political and local dynamics between the two nations. Furthermore, the language choice is not merely a function of sociological factors such as generation, education, class, and geographic location. While the global, the local, and the sociological factors are important, in the end, it is the author's choice of what they deem as marketable and readable, as well as writable, meaning as a written expression of their identity. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, this is, uh, I think, all four speakers actually elaborated on the, what Orly Friedman said, the reversal of the power relations. All of you engaged in one way or the other of how history flips itself and what are the consequences, whether they are lingual or whether they are political or whether they are student. And I think that was very important and unusual. And, and I commend uh, Amal Jamalo and Nava for thinking about it because normally we talk about the oppression, we talk about maybe the liberation, but we don't contemplate about what is after. Uh, and uh, the task of understanding, recognition, uh, peace building, etc., never ends with some kind of political solution, but it's an ongoing process. So this was eye-opening for me. I want to ask more specifically, I mean, with uh, Orly and with um, Professor Schwartz, what's the Leslie, right? It was a, quite a gloomy picture. I mean, can you uh, still give us a uh, possibility of, I mean, things were worse before. Uh, it's, it's not black and white. There's obviously some kind of reconciliation happening, something in the new state. And with uh, Camilla, yeah? First of all, I would like to say that Said Kashua spoke maybe twice, at least in our campus in Beersheba, Bil Arabi, Haka Bil Arabi. Yani Mush Awal Marafi. Uh, uh, but also, maybe it wasn't so scholarly, but I want to ask you about the issue of, uh, uh, of power and the language. That is, what is the possibility of minority after losing power, like the Palestinians, still prospering in their own uh, language, which is the language of the enemy? Is that at all possible? Yeah. Well, I have a very bleak picture about, you know, because there's a hierarchy of languages, but uh, I like to look at Arabic in Israel as part of a larger whole. What's happening in the Palestinian Authority, what's happening in Jordan, what's happening in Egypt, in Morocco, and uh, everyone I talk to and everyone I read that he writes about this, they have a gloomy picture of Arabic is deteriorating, is retreating, its influence is retreating. And that is indeed true. But here in specific in Israel, uh, I just wrote uh, another uh, chapter about uh, the uh, linguistic landscape and uh, of Arabic in Israel. Even though it's an official language, it's, it's absent. We don't see it. I was even in a cafe in Nazareth, and uh, the menu was in English and Hebrew. And the young man is Arab. And I told him, uh, can I have uh, the menu in Arabic? And he said, I could translate to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it it is absent except in road signs because on highways because of the law, the new law that uh, from a decade ago or so that makes it uh, imperative to have Arabic in the highways. But it has a lot of spelling mistakes too. <laughs> I'm absolutely guilty of 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 what you charge. I think it's it's partly because p part of what made the transition in South Africa possible was a kind of exceptionalism. The idea that we were different from everywhere in the world. There was a kind of messianic glow around Mandela for, for reasons which are obvious. He was a very, we haven't had a leader like that in the world, and a sort of utopianism. And I think that we had, and I think the whole world had certain expectations of South Africa, which we're used to now seeing in South Africa that were, were unrealistic. But I, when I travel, I, I find that I have to always talk against type because people don't want to hear. The other side. I, th I mean, there have been enormous changes in South Africa, and, and uh, my wife always says that South Africans are very good at complaining, and you've just had seen an example of it in me. But um, 
what we should do, every South African should have to go back to 1985 just every Monday and we'll stop complaining. I mean, you know, that's, it's really important. People being shot in the streets, it's you know, just unbelievable. So we've, we, there, are in, there are in a huge number of ways in which there's been substantial change. I hope I started off talking a bit about how my institution has changed, what's been possible with our, with, um, our, our students and, and, and wonderful things. I mean, I teach, I teach people who, who grew up uh, and, and have kind of gone to, to doctoral level being taught under a tree in a rural area who never had any expectation. The parents were domestic workers. I mean, there, so there are, there are lots um, of these um, stories. We have a great freedom of the press. So South Africa has been a corrupt country for a very long time. We now know about the corruption. So we had a very, the apartheid government was riddled with corruption. Nobody heard about it. We have a corrupt uh, president now, and in my, in my view, it's in the paper every day. We have a public protector who's under pressure, but she's taking him to task. She's a black woman taking the, the president to task. So we have, part of what is difficult for us to accept in South Africa is that we now have ordinary, we have, all the, all, we have ordinary things like a lot of crime, um, a lot of difficulties, and we're not that special. Um, but that is part, part of what also makes it wonderful to be in South Africa. And I, I don't want to be anywhere else, because certainly for, in terms of my own work, the possibility to feel that one is actually being part of a change that means something, that is going somewhere. Within how, how the post-war reality has shaped itself, Kosovo is still very much, uh, even lo some local activists would now frame it as being colonized by the internationals who are still there. So that also kind of shapes the lives of people as long as the international community is still there. And uh, it's a big question, I think. Uh, but there are some markers that one can find. If, if you, but you need to, it's, it's difficult, but you can find some. Um, for example, everyone is now looking towards the EU. And, and that, that is a possible uniter and not necessarily a divider. Uh, the language even, if you look at it inside Kosovo, uh, I've, I've met through my search for daily encounters between people, local Serbs, and the, the question is hanging, can Serbs stay and live in Kosovo, which is now a very Albanian space. And so I've seen some local people who realize that if they want to stay, they must study Albanian. That's the only future that they can have with Serbian only they don't have future there in terms of jobs, in terms of their uh, future prosperity. And I think actually in Kosovo itself, Serbs and Albanians have the very same challenges and same questions that they ask themselves. And that's questions of uh, being tired of corrupt politicians, of lack of infrastructure, lack of jobs, very low wages. So these are commonalities. And, and on that ground, you see more and more actually cooperation. So there are more Serbs who stayed in Kosovo and are participating in the new structures of the new state. There are Serbs in the parliament, there are deputy ministers, there are ministers, they're participating in the new state that is being uh, created. And these are very, very important um, processes. And on the level of civil society, there is the project of dealing with the past. This is the umbrella, if you want, or what I like to look more at memory activism and people who are looking in the last two decades and what happened in the construction of memories in the present. And they need each other to cooperate. And this is happening also on different uh, levels. And so there is a big question. The region was one in the past, it broke up through a very violent conflict, and now they can only imagine their future again in the same, coming together again, just under a different flag possibly. And a very marginal voice would tell you that the ability to reimagine a Balkan confederation again, but that will leave just as a, as a very, very small group of people. But these are kind of sort of even discourses that will bring, they have to bring people together. Uh, one on the issue of language, uh, the Irish language, which was nearly dead, is actually re resurgent again. And, and 
in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is interesting. Um, but it's caught, it also causes some other issues of division. Um, I think the on the issue of the future, um, the the problem where we are right now is, which given that we're having an election in a couple of days' time, uh, national election, is it's still the the issue of the status of the extreme. Uh, we we maintain our status by by driving people out to the edge, and the question is how do you get the centre ground? The pro and in the middle of that, the problem, the significant challenge that we have is, the, um, and it, it's different from the centre ground that I'm using. The middle ground, are, or the middle class, abandoned the field. They went off to their golf clubs, or they went off to wherever they could go to and put their hunker down and hope that the world would change for them, uh, leaving the edges to fight it out. But zero-sum politics uh, uh, do not work, and therefore we're also losing the next generation coming up. We're losing our civic center, because young people think of plague in all your houses. The counterbalance problem of that is, and I'll finish with this, is use a, um, an Irish phrase, or uh, this is, with the paramilitaries, the people on the edge who, who are maintaining the offset power is that turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So what does the future offer them? If, you're, if your edge is always through the status, is always maintained by offering a narrative difference as, uh, and fear of the other, then what does that new space offer them except the dissolution of their status? There is a, 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 an attempt still to capture a very fluid reality through uh, rigid concepts. And I think this, is, this cr creates some of the problems that you, uh, you've indicated. Like if, uh, I would suggest, for instance, to use deconstruction as a methodology of the realities in which you, 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 what, you know, you're talking about. And I think we'll, we'll see a completely different reality. I think. Uh, and this will enable us actually to use analysis as a way of resistance of the power situation or the power relations in the reality in which you live. I think this is, the, this is part of the problem uh, that we face, that the power relations actually determine the concepts by which we see this reality. And our role should be actually bring up a new language, a completely different language in order to overcome power relations. And part of uh, what's going on uh, whether in South Africa, in the Balkans, in Israel, Palestine, or in Northern Ireland, is that we're sometimes caught, and I'm, I'm not talking about you personally only, but in general, part of the analysis, you know, reflected this a bit. Uh, still speaking about borders, about rigidity, about, you know, uh, 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 compartmentalization, and so on and so on. I think if we try to bring you know, Zygmunt Bauman in, for instance, or Jacques Derrida in, or, and so on and so on. I think we will bring in a completely different language that will enable us to see that things are fluid, things are, you know, in flux all the time, and thereby we can resist also power relations. We can bring in, like, uh, the issue of language here, Ala Ahlehel is one of the best, I think, to reflect this uh, liquidity. Yeah. The, in, the, the uh, unwillingness to be you know, within a certain power structure and to actually manipulate and uh, delude uh, the reality in a way that you can't capture him. I think Emil Habibi was, was one of the best in the past and Ala Ahlehel is one of the best today. What drove the post-colonial enterprise in Africa was a kind of pan-Africanism and a, and a discursive um, calling upon the idea of a sort of idealized Africanness. Some of you might know in Southern Africa we have this concept called Ubuntu, which is... Um, Mandela used to talk about a person isn't a person except in relation to, to other people. And there's, there's lots of these, these binaries which, um, which are, are useful in terms of mobilization but actually lead you only so far. Um, and um, certainly, in the, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in the field of, uh, of disability studies. And, and uh, part of what I think has happened, if there's, a, there's a, quite a big discourse in disability around, well, we don't need independence in Africa because we're all interdependent, so we look after disabled people. The evidence is not, you know, the, I've seen many examples where that is not, not true. So, so you know, the, the question of who's included and who's excluded is often, I think, uh, 
made worse by, by resorting to these essential categories. And, and, and we, we spent, uh, Deb Proposal, who I think is one of the smartest social scientists in South Africa, wrote a piece a few years ago about the persistence of racial labels in South Africa, that we don't have a language. I still talk about white, black, I'm embarrassed, but we still talk about those, we still collect statistics in those terms. And so on. And I think Mbembe, who I didn't have time to talk about more, has really made a major contribution in South Africa around that. But I, th I think you're right. I mean, just the, the, the question of, of what these categories do and the, the more you try to sort of peel them apart, the more they reassert themselves, especially in a, in a space for um, activist and academic discourse where people have differential access to the English language. And I do want to say something about language politics in South Africa. In the first version of my talk, I had a quotation from a poet. Afrikaans was the language of, the, of apartheid, but it was, it was never a, a white language. It was always a predominantly black language, which most people don't know. And one of, for me, one of our best South African poets is a woman called Ronelda Comfort, who writes very movingly in an award-winning um, set of poems. It's, it's, the, the, uh, it's called um, When Sleeping Dogs Wake. And so she's saying the sleeping dogs are not lying. She's got a line in that poem about now that I speak Afrikaans. And what she's saying is that now as a progressive black South African, I can speak Afrikaans again because I wouldn't before, even though it was my mother tongue. But, it, but, it's, but it's taken something away from me now that I speak Afrikaans again. So, so the whole question of, of linguistic positioning and so on is also not, not uh, kind of easy. I'll and, just remind me, we have uh, four uh, minutes to finish. I just want to say our students absolutely loved our course. Um, it's in a, um, whether, I mean, our big question, and they, they continue to enjoy and appreciate these sorts of op safe opportunities. Um, I do a very uncomfortable session on race and psychotherapy with, with my students. They always love it. The question to which this actually changes things is a, is a different sort of question, but they are desperate, in fact, to, to have more of this, provided it is, it is contained in an authentic way. And I think part of the containing it in an authentic way is indicating how incredibly uncomfortable we are as educators with doing this with them. And that's what makes a difference for me. The work I did, unfortunately, I didn't find the type of encounters that uh, I think you're talking about or that I knew from the School for Peace in Neve Shalom, Rahdam Salam. So I looked for what was out there. And the reactions are very different if you, from both sides, and I won't have the time to explain that. So I think the need that I see is, I mean, among the organizers of those structures is to politicize the encounters because there's too much of the hummus encounters or they, they will call it the chevapi encounters, or the, right? So that, that's one of the problems. But what I did find is that from the point of view of Serbs, for example, going to Pristina, to Kosovo, it's the ultimate other now. The Croat used to be the other, they're gone long ago. The Bosnians, the Bosniaks are gone as well. And they actually speak the same language and consume the same culture. The Albanians are the others now. And so that kind of raises very challenging and interesting dynamics that happens actually. Uh, plus, uh, it's almost considered like cutting edge, very cool at some point for activists to go to Pristina to do this kind of work because so few do it. Um, yeah, so I'll, that's the short. In our community, the, the people, uh, unfortunately, the, the so the students who are coming together to kind of meet are, so the hard dialogues are with, with the marginalized. And the, the dialogue that happens across those who are coming from different backgrounds, or the more easier set of backgrounds, is they're not interested. And what they have is, a, is they've taken another identity narrative, which is of me and mine which is the, the more Western globalized, and they have to invent themselves every day. So they're trapped in inventing themselves every day. I can say from my own experience as a group facilitator, I've been facilitating group for the last <laughs> few years, uh, to say the least. And uh, we in Israel and Palestine, we have, uh, I would call it um, um, narcissistic the disorder because we think that the sun rises from where our food goes out in the sense of we think that we are the only people that are living in conflict and we do not um, actually you know exchange um, knowledge from either uh, the political situations or the grassroots or contested cities mixed cities shared cities whatever you want to 
uh, to say. And I think that um, understanding that we're not the only people in conflict has says two things. One is that, like, like Maler says, um, the most difficult task of growing up is becoming one amongst many in the sense of, you know, gathering the the skills that are needed by by others to be a um, social creature. And on the other hand, understanding that you're not special. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for making us feel not special.